Happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome to Hour of Power. What a blessing it is to come and share together tonight in the word of the Lord. I'm so grateful tonight for the opportunity that he's afforded us to share together. God is so good and he's worthy of all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. And I'm certainly grateful for this moment in time that he's given us. Before we go any further, let's pray. Father, we come in the wonderful name of Jesus to say thank you for another day. We thank you for the beauty of this day. We thank you for your goodness, your kindness, your faithfulness, and your love. The opportunity that you've given us to come together to share around your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It is your word that gives us direction, that leads us to destined places in you, and that we will become all that you've destined us to be as we trust and walk in your word. So Holy Spirit, illuminate the scriptures to us tonight. Our hearts are open to receive. Our minds are open to receive. Cause us to, to, to be able to grow in the grace and the knowledge of you as we hear your word and that we could be the vessels of honor fit for your use, equipped for every good work that you've assigned our hands to do. We give you praise, glory, and honor for it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, bless God for the opportunity to share tonight. I do thank God for all of you. I'm so grateful for the Kingdom Life Cathedral Ministry citizens and your families. I'm so honored and humbled to be a part of one of the greatest families on the face of planet Earth. What a blessing to all of you that are sharing tonight far and near watch parties, home meetings that have come to join us in the word. What a blessing to the King's Apostle Church International family and to the Kingdom Life Fellowship family. We bless God for all of you who joined us tonight. We conti we're continuing in the book of Proverbs with our series, Wisdom for Living. We're gonna continue um, with uh, Proverbs chapter 13. I believe that's where we are in the flow of wisdom. I'm a firm believer that what's needed more than ever in these times that we're living in is godly wisdom. The kind of wisdom that will help you and I to make good decisions, to set the, the right trajectories for living godly lives, not only for ourselves, but for our families and to be able to follow the path that God has ordained us to. God is a great God. And he does give wisdom to those who desire it. I don't know about you. I thank God for the opportunity to have godly wisdom. Let's pick up tonight with uh, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10. Verse number 10 of Proverbs chapter 13. And we're going to jump right in. What a blessing to see all of you coming on and joining us tonight. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10. By pride comes nothing but strife, but with the well advised is wisdom. But with the well advised is wisdom. Let's read that again. By pride comes nothing but strife, but with the well advised comes is wisdom. Proverbs 13 and 10. Solomon, as you can remember from our study, uh, was the wisest man that ever lived outside of Jesus. It was under his tenure as king that Israel uh, built one of the greatest temples that was ever built. 
uh, the project took over seven years to complete and Solomon entered a partnership with other kings and nations to outsource what his nation did not specialize in. All in all, the project uh, required over 200,000 workers and a budget over a billion dollars. This information is, I think, important because it helps us to know something about the one who has been imparting and God used to bring wisdom to us. Although God has given him remarkable wisdom, he knew that he could not accomplish everything alone. I think that's an important point. Solomon surrounded himself with people and welcomed their counsel and um, their guidance to accomplish what God desired for him to do. There is another uh, narrative in the scripture um, with another one of my favorite characters, um, patriots in the scripture of the Old Testament is Moses. And in Exodus 18, we find out that Moses had a problem. He was the leader of Israel, but he was attempting to address all the issues that arose by himself. His father's law's name was Jethro. And Jethro said to him, what you are doing is not good. You and these people will come to you. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work was too heavy. You cannot handle it alone. So Jephro tells him to listen to him and he gives him some good advice. He tells him to select capable men from all the people, men who feared God, who were trustworthy, who hated dishonest gain. And he was to appoint them as officials over thousands, over hundreds and over fifties and have them serve as judge for the people at all times. Have them bring the difficult cases to you and simple cases they can decide for themselves. In other words, Jethro gave him a case management system for managing people. And he told, the reason was that this would make the load lighter and they can share it with you. And if you do this, as God commands, he tells him, you'll be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. And Moses heeded his advice. His load became lighter and he and the nation prospered because it. we have to be willing, especially as leaders, but all of us, whether you're a parent, you're a leader, whether you you, you're a supervisor on your job, you're a leader, whether you're a leader and uh, you're leading, you're doing something in the church. We all have some type of leadership skills and capabilities and we lead in some area in life. We can't do it by ourselves. We need the guidance and the help of others. And there are those who know more than we do. Moses heeded the advice of his father-in-law Jethro and he and the nation prospered. Solomon solicited the help of others to complete the magnificent temple that he built, and it was successful. Three things I want to share with you. Number one, you don't know it all. <laughs> Three quick things. You don't know it all. Don't allow pride to make you think you do. Because you don't. You don't know it all. Pride. Please recognize that I deserve exaltation itself. You don't know it all, and it's okay. Number two, you can't do it all. You will burn yourself out, and then you won't be any good to anyone. You can't do it all. And number three, you can't make every decision. You must surround yourself with wise people and then trust and empower them to perform your intent. As a pastor, as a bishop, I've learned to trust people. They might not do it exactly the way I want, I would do it, but they do it in the spirit that I would do it. It helps me, I can't do it all. I'm not gonna try. Living as long as I live and I, in a few more days, I'm gonna be another year older. I've come to understand that, hey, I need the help of others.
And it is better, as you know I said, it is better when we what? Do it together. It is, it, it, we need one another. Let's go on. Verse number 11. Flow of wisdom. Here it is, verse 11. Powerful verse. Wealth, and let's look at it from the New Living Translation first. Wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. Listen from it, the New King James Version. Wealth gained by dishonesty will be dis diminished. But he who gathers by labor will increase. The principle behind this passage is that which com that which comes easily slips away readily. That which comes easily can easily slip away. Jeremiah 17 and 11 says, as a partridge that broods but does not hatch, so is he who gets riches, but not by right. It will leave him in the midst of his days, and at his end, he will be a fool. The Hebrew word for blessed is barak, B-A-R-A-K. The Hebrew word for create, create is bara, B-A-R-A. Pronunciations are there. God only borrows, creates what he barocks, blesses. God only creates what he blesses, meaning God only, or God blesses what he creates. Sorry, yes. God borrows what he barocks. God blesses what he creates. The Father will only back, protect, and bless the things he leads you to do. When you and I get out on our own, we're in trouble. We need to follow the lead of God. Where he leads, he feeds. Where he guides, he provides. I'm going to say that again. Where he leads, he feeds. Where he guides, he provides. But when you and I are not walking with him, we have to face all that comes, right or wrong, by ourselves. We're on our own. But when we follow God's plan, he blesses us every time. Bishop, what does this mean? Wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished, but he who gathers by labor will increase. It means God is interested in every area of your life. He's concerned with your relationships, your health, your development as a person, your progress toward uh, arriving at your destiny. And he's concerned about your finances. He's not against you getting ahead. As a matter of fact, God wants you to get ahead. He wants to bless the works of your hands. God wants to, don't, don't you dare let go, hallelujah, of, of being successful and prosperous even in this season. God wants to bless you, but you got to follow his principles. The father is not against wealth, but he is completely against seeking wealth the wrong way. So you got to get wealth the right way, and he's going to bless you. He's going to direct you. He's going to strengthen you. This is the season that he's blessing his people. And you don't want to miss what he's doing. This is the time to stir up your faith and go for the gusto. But do it the right way. Do it God's way. Don't go any other way but God's way and watch him bless you. Verse number 12, because I could stay there a while tonight. Verse 12, I love this verse. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when desire comes, it is a tree of life. Let's read that again. Verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when desires come, it is a tree of life. In this verse, Solomon tells us that hope is put off. Some translations say deferred. It makes one's heart sick. In other words, there, there's great disappointment that can be birthed from the inside out when a person that has been waiting for something for so long and it doesn't seem to come to fruition. 
Some people have been in a place of disappointment so often that they've become disillusioned. But I want you tonight to not become disillusioned at all. For the gospel tells us that there is a hope that does not disappoint. And that hope is birthed in our heart by God. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Paul says something about hope that's important. He says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not only does Paul call God the God of hope, but his prayer is for believers in Rome and for you and I uh, uh, to, 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 to abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is supernatural hope. And his prayer for them came after teaching, much teaching on godly hope. In the first chapter, Paul lets the, uh, the believers in Rome know that he dearly wanted to visit them, but he was unable to. So he sends this teaching letter, the book of Romans, to Jews and Gentiles alike. Um, and he's, in his letter, in masterful uh, 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 literary work, he talks about salvation and faith and redemption, justification and righteousness and hope. When he gets to the fourth chapter of the book of Romans, Paul talks uh taught them about unwavering faith of Abraham, a man that stood on the promise of God for 25 years. Paul explains that Abraham hoped against hope, meaning that he maintained godly hope even when human hope was gone. Hallelujah. You see, Abraham and Sarah had been given, had, had given up their hope to have a child. Abraham was 99 and Sarah was 90 when God told them that they would still have a baby. Sarah had been barren all her life and Abraham's body was also by this point uh, uh, in their lives humanly dead. But they maintained their hope and they continued to believe in a God that could turn hopelessness into situations, into hopeful situations. God is in the business of turning things around. They had a baby, even after all human hope had dissipated. This is why it's so important that you understand that your hope has to be in God. Don't let your hope go. Don't defer hope. Keep believing. Keep pressing. In fact, in this season that we're in right now, it's a good thing to stir up the hope of God in you. Stir up your dream. Let your faith rise like never before. Who told you you couldn't? Who said that you can't? Did God tell you that? If he didn't, let hope come alive in you tonight. Glory to God. Let your hope get stirred tonight. You see, chapter four is the backdrop to chapter five. Romans chapter five, verse one says, therefore, since I, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to say, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace, hallelujah, in which we now stand and we boast in the hope, glory to God, the hope of the glory of God. This is the peace that Abraham had while he was waiting on God, a peace that enables us to keep hope alive. Paul continues to say that we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Hallelujah. This is not human hope. This is not limited hope. This is hope that is birthed by God himself. Let's put that verse back up there, Brother uh, Elder Wilson, if we can. And not only so, verse 3 of chapter 5 of Romans, but we also glory, we also rejoice in suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Hallelujah. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Paul has been through many challenges himself, and he explains the challenges should not cause believers to give up. Don't give up just because it's a tight place. It's a difficult place. 
That's, you should do just the opposite. As believers, challenges, crises, and conflicts come our way. But it develops within us a perseverance, a character, and hope. These things come to make us strong. See, even in the midst of what you're going through right now, don't you dare give up. Don't you dare go in the town. But you ought to give praise to the Most High God, a God who is able to see you through. Paul says that this hope does not disappoint. Why? Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us we can be assured that we will not be disappointed when we walk with God because we know that he loves us. Listen, I want to speak to your hope and say, hope come alive in the name of Jesus. Be stirred. Let your expectation be of him. Hallelujah. Lift up your heads and look to the Father for all of your help comes from the Lord. I said all of your help comes from the Lord. That's right. Shake it off. Shake off depression. Shake off defeat. Shake off discouragement right now. Hallelujah. I call hope forth in you. Rise up, my brother. Rise up, my sister. And let hope come alive in you. Well, I feel God right now. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. I see your praises. It's a good place to get your praise on. That's right. Send up some hearts. Send up some glory. Hallelujah. Because God is moving in the midst of his people right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let hope arise. Hallelujah. Let your hope arise, my brothers and sisters. Let's look at verse 13 to 15. We can stop right there and have church. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Verse 13. Proverbs 13 and 13. He who despises the word will be destroyed. But he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. He who despises the word will be destroyed. But he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. Verse 14. The law of wisdom is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. And verse 15. God understand, good understanding, gains favor. But the way of the unfaithful is hard. There is, my brothers and sisters, a fundamental attitude of respect that you and I should have toward the word of God, which will bring great reward and favor in and of itself. There is a fundamental attitude of contempt and disrespect for the word of God, which will result in temporal hardship and not bring the favor and the blessings of God to us. Pharaoh held the word of God in contempt and died the death of the wicked. Saul did not listen to the voice of the Lord and died the sin unto death at the battle of Gilboa. Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedadiah, the last three kings of Judah, did not honor the word of God. Each learned that the way of a transgressor is hard. You see, God demands that his word be held in honor. Very, very important that we understand that. God demands that his word be held in honor. Martin Luther, the great theologian, appeared before a council of accusers. They wanted him to repudiate his unwavering faith in the all-sufficiency uh, of the word of God. He was being persecuted for placing more authority in scripture than the leadership of the church at the time. Listen to his response. Martin Luther said this word, unless I am convicted by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. God help me, here I stand. You see, like Martin Luther, we must have a steadfast belief in the infallible, inerrant, 
inexhaustible word of God, infallible, inerrant, and inexhaustible word of God. If there is ever a conflict between the Bible and man's teaching, the answer is clear. The Bible is right. Smith Wiggle's words said this about the word, said this about the word. The Bible is the word of God. I love this. Supernatural in origin, eternal in duration, inexpressible in valor, infinite in scope, regenerative in power, infallible in authority, universal in interest, personal in application, and inspired in totality. We should read it through, write it down, pray it in, work it out, then pass it on. Oh, isn't that powerful? Hallelujah. I love that last part right there. Hallelujah. Read it through, write it down, pray it in, Work it out and pass it on. That's what we should do with the word of God. John MacArthur said this. The book contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, the happiness of believers. Its doctrine is holy. Its precepts are binding. Its histories are true and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be saved. Practice it to be holy, for it contains light to direct you, food to support you, comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. The answer, my brothers and sisters, is in the word of God. What you need, you can find in his word. The Bible is God's word. You and I must follow it. We must obey it. We must apply its teachings to our life and we will prosper. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It illuminates and gives me direction. His word, hallelujah. Hallelujah's word bring is in the entrance of his word brings light, it brings awareness, it shows me, it guides me. Thank God for his uncompromising word tonight. Amen. Let's look at verse 16. Verse 16 of Proverbs 13. Bless God for all of you tonight. This is some good, good flow of wisdom tonight. I'm being blessed all over again. Hallelujah, as we share tonight. Every prudent man. Acts with knowledge, but a fool lays open his folly. Solomon here in this verse contrasts the wisdom of taking the time to think before you act and the foolishness that is often uh, brought about when we act in haste. And I know this can be tough because we're in a society where everything is quick, fast, and a hurry instant everything humans today don't like waiting for anything or slowing down at all we get up in a hurry harry we go to sleep late uh we we get up early we lay down late and we try to do a hundred things um when we know we only have time to do 25. most of us have to-do lists i've got several uh, with no end in sight our calendars are full of meetings conference calls zoom meetings places to go, people to meet, our desks, our inbox are full of stuff. It's always something to do, something to do, something to do, always busy. Everything has to be done. So we sacrifice at times quality for quickness. Solomon ran a successful nation with a surplus economy. He knew a thing or two about getting things done. And his wisdom to us is to slow down long enough to think before we speak and act. Think it through. He makes it clear that fools don't, and while none of us want to be a fool, it would be honest, if we would be honest, we sometimes act like it when we don't give issues the proper time they need. Stop rushing. 
one of the things that's so important about me, walking through Proverbs. And I said, you know, and I have to catch myself. Sometimes I'm to say, slow down, slow down. Where am I going? Why? Because we want to get all that we can. Take our time. Listen, life ain't going nowhere. You'll get it done. Take your time to think some things through. The challenge with, uh, with, with life today and many people, many people are not thinkers. Most people don't even like to think. They're so uh, 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 accustomed to rushing through the day that they don't give any one thing the courtesy of a good thought. Very important that we learn to think. God has blessed us, you and I, with mental ability, but most of us don't take the time to use it. We are so driven to get things done that we don't realize that we can actually get more done in a more quality fashion if we slow down long enough to think. Somebody should write that down in the comment. Slow me down, Lord. Let me think. Slow me down, Lord. Let me think. Very, very important that we slow down. That we think think things through it simply means that you should slow down long enough to get a clear mental picture i'm not saying that you should not act that you shouldn't do some things but you should act with careful thought once you have the knowledge you should act with confidence Slow yourself down. Verse 17. Let's go on. Proverbs 13 and 17. A wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful ambassador brings health. Now, an ambassador is sent to represent the nation within a host nation. They represent a, a, their nation um, at a nation that's hosting them. The role meaning that if, if I'm uh, up from the United States and I am sent to be the uh, ambassador to Great Britain, I'm sent to represent my the United States in Great Britain, I would be the ambassador for the United States in Great Britain. The role of the ambassador is to establish relationships within the host nation while maintaining his integrity and loyalty to his parent nation. When communication is sent from the parent nation, the ambassador is to communicate that information, no matter how pleasant or objectable it might be. Additionally, the ambassador is, rep is to represent that information as if it were his own whether he agrees with it or not. The ambassador cannot allow his personal opinion to disrupt or dilute the message of the parent nation. Why is this important? It's important because the same holds true for you and I. We may not hold the title ambassador, but we may be asked to serve as a representative God has called all of us to be representatives in his kingdom, both in the ministry and in the marketplace. We have the ability to represent Jesus Christ. We must be faithful in our representation of, of God. God did not save us just so we could sing songs on Sunday and say hallelujah. He wants us to grow and that we would indeed be extensions of his kingdom in the marketplace. He wants to bless the works of our hands. He wants to use us as, as, as bold individuals who can now have an impact on our culture. God is calling you and I to impact the culture. It is the biggest challenge that the church must emerge to during this time 
of God stirring and restructuring and restoring and realigning us for greater purpose. His intended purpose is always greater. God is doing that and he's calling you and I to arise in this hour to have greater impact. Amen. Church is not usual because the believer is not is not the same. We're coming out of this pandemic with a fresh new kingdom perspective. Hallelujah. That's even more rooted in scripture than we could ever imagine. This is why God is calling for us to arise and go and infiltrate and make a difference in the world. Hallelujah. To, 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 to be the ambassadors for Christ in the world. Hallelujah. The father needs you. He needs I, uh, uh, me, you and I to make a change in our world. We're called, we are a counterculture. Hallelujah. We are a force to be reckoned with in the earth. We are God's anointed children. And he's called you and I to be ambassadors, to bring health and wholeness. Our world is sick. The ideologies, the thought patterns, the the modes of conduct is unhealthy and yet God has saved you and I for in such a time as this and he's calling you and I to come forth to bring health where there is sickness. And I'm not just talking about physical sickness. God wants to heal the land. He said he would heal the land. And he's going to use you and I to bring healing. You and I have been assigned some divine appointments, some divine assignments. Yes, you, you sitting, listening to me tonight, you that with your Bible on your lap. Yes, God has an appointment. He's got an anointing on your life. There's a calling on your life. It's time for you to arise up. Bishop, how can I make an impact? I, I, I don't even go out the house. I'm still I'm still uh, dealing with my own self in the pandemic. Oh, my brothers and sisters, God is going to still use you in this hour. I feel the anointing of God to tell you it's your opportunity to arise so he can use you, anoint you, that you can have an impact right where you are. Yes. We are going into all the world, hallelujah, and letting them know that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I believe I have some people that are ready. If you're ready to make that kind of impact, give me some hearts and some thumbs up. Let me know that you're with me, that God is with us. Hallelujah. I see you coming. That's right. If you believe God, God has got you uh, ready. Divine assignments, divine appointments. Let your hope be stirred. Don't let it be deferred. Wealth and riches are upon you. Oh, look, wisdom is flowing your direction tonight. Getting you ready for your assignment. Verse 18. Verse 18. Proverb, poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction. But he who regards a rebuke will be honored. Poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction. But he who regards a rebuke will be honored. We live in a society today that is straying away from standards. Instead of calling right and wrong, right, right, wrong, wrong, we have a tendency to accept any and everything. We uh, uh, are, 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 are we're becoming more of a society of relativism rather than in binding, uh, having boundaries of absolute truth which is dangerous. We all need correction and criticism, structured criticism, if we ought, if we're going to become the men and women that God desires us to be. We cannot, here it is again, maximize our purpose and potential without the input, the, 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 the encouragement, the admonishment, the correction of others. Let's get some definitions so we can all understand something. Criticism. Criticism is the act of judging on the merit of performance. 
remark on the beauties and faults, the critical observation. Correction, the act of bringing back from error or deviation to a just standard as to truth, justice, that which is intended to rectify or cure faults. All scripture is profitable for correction. Withhold not correction from a child, the scripture teaches us. Webster's references Paul's words to Timothy. Let's look at it. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Without correction, we would all go astray. Earlier in, in Proverbs, Solomon said, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. Solomon, uh, Proverbs 12, 1, but he who hates correction is stupid. Solomon was quite possibly the wisest human to ever live outside of Jesus Christ. But even Solomon made mistakes. Not even Solomon uh, could get around the fact that he needed correction. Godly correction are purposeful and very necessary. Correction doesn't, and here's, here's why it's important. And I know people don't, we're in a time where people uh, 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 I call them free range parenting. Don't correct your children. I don't think you should not uh, help guide their thinking and thought, but you do have to correct them. Because if you don't correct them as a child, they'll never be able to see, re receive correction and instruction. It will become harder as an adult. None of us are perfect. Godly correction is necessary. As believers, we need to be corrected. We must welcome correction and not fight against it. Solomon called those who fight against correction stupid. I didn't say it. Solomon did. Solomon's warning is clear. If you reject criticism, if you reject correction, it will lead to poverty. It will lead to disgrace. Many people who have wrecked uh, their lives by refusing to accept the counsel of those God sent to correct them. So as you enter this day, determine to be a fat Christian. Yeah, probably one of the few times you want to use that word, fat Christian. Faithful, available, and teachable. Fat Christian, faithful, available, and teacher. Go on. Today, you can celebrate being a fat Christian, being faithful, available, and teachable. Verse 19, a desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. Let's read it again, Proverbs 13 and 19. A desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. Solomon here is talking to us about dreams and desires and how we all love it when dreams come true. Dreams are powerful. Um, journalist, journalist Gloria Steinem says, without leaps of imagination of dreaming, we lose the excitement of possibilities. Dreaming, after all, is a form of planning. It's awesome to dream. I love to do it. I do it all the time. I, I, I dream all the time. I'm dreaming about ministry. I'm dreaming about you and the family. Dream about Kingdom Life Cathedral Ministries and all the things that God wants to do and how we can get it done and how we're going to be. I, I, I dream all the time. We must 
not allow our dreams to die. I know that if a dream is ever going to come to pass, I must make decisions, good decisions, and put forth the action to see the dream become a reality. Dreams will not come to pass by accident. We must operate with purpose and focus if we ever want to see the dream become a reality. If we want to see what God has placed in our hearts and birthed in our hearts, we must put ourselves to the plow and work. We can't continue to live our lives on autopilot. We must be purposeful in our movement. We believe we know where we're going. We fully expect to arrive there one day at the place called destiny. It all sounds good. The word sounds good. The problem is that our path is never without resistance. Even subtle changes, if unchecked, can get us off course. That's why Solomon warns us here about refusing to turn from evil. Make no mistake. Just like we serve a real God, there is a real devil. And he will do all that he can to get us off course. He does not want to see the manifestation of dreams. He does not want to see God's best come to pass in our lives. He does not want to see God's best come to pass for your families. So he will do his best to distract and divert us from the path of the dream. Solomon teaches us that if we refuse to turn from evil, we are fools and we will not see the manifestation of God's dream in our lives. So, Apostle, how do I, that doesn't happen. What do I need to do? It means that self-denial is essential to success. There is some sacrifice. If you're going to arrive at God's desired end for your life, you're going to have to do it on purpose, not haphazardly. Not haphazardly, not at all. Listen to this quote. I have learned that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live life that he has imagined, he will meet with success unexpected in common hours. I'm telling you, God is up to something. Don't let your dreams go. Don't let your vision go. Hold on to it. But do the work. Verse 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise. But the companion of fools will be destroyed. Now remember, Solomon was the wisest man in the land. He knew firsthand the great lengths that people would go through to spend just a few minutes with him. How much do you think an hour with Solomon would be worth? Most people we choose to associate with say a great deal about us. Most people choose friends that have like interests, ambitions, character, and lifestyle. And I know that today the word friend is used very lightly but it should really be reserved for those that can make a positive influence on our lives and we vice versa. Remember, our time here on earth is limited. So we should choose carefully how we spend our time because at the end of each day, good or bad, we have, we have one less day to do what God has given us. I want to challenge you to do something. Surround yourself with the right people and you will become the right person. Surround yourself 
with the right people and you'll become the right person. What does that mean, Bishop? It means that your friends matter. Some things are taught, but many things are simply caught. You pick up things from people as you hang out with them. So make sure you're hanging out with the right crowd. Choose the right friends and you will influ be influenced the right way. Surround yourself with fools and you'll become a fool yourself. Choose the right friends. Verse 21. Evil pursues sinners, but the righteous good shall be repaid. Evil pursues sinners, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. The New Living Translation makes it plain. It says, trouble chases sinners while blessings reward the righteous. I won't read that again. Trouble chases sinners while blessings reward the righteous. If you really want to see the two options, options the benefit of walking with God and the perils of walking without him, truly flesh out all you have to do is read Deuteronomy chapter 28. Listen, it was one of the signature texts that my, my father in the gospel, our chief apostle, Wilbur Baltimore, teaches. Deuteronomy chapter 28. The chapter opens and Moses said, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands that I give you today, the Lord your God will. And then he goes on and lays out 14 verses of promises of both secular and spiritual blessings. If you haven't read it in a while, I challenge you to sometime in this week, read Deuteronomy 28. In verse 15, Moses says, but if you refuse to listen to the Lord your God and do not obey all the commands and the decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come and overwhelm you. He proceeds to lay out 53 verses of both secular and spiritual curses. He spends more than three times the amount of verses explaining the curse than the blessing. Why? I believe it's because the Father wants us to know that our decisions matter. Our life is a grand sum total of our decisions. Back to chapter 11 of Solomon, it says, if good people are rewarded here on this earth, all who are cruel, mean, and mean will surely be punished. You can't have reward without judgment. Our actions are constantly being judged. God created a system of law and principles, sowing and reaping, cause and effect, and the free will of humans that govern the earth. So not only will all be judged eventually, which is the ultimate judgment, but our actions are also being judged regularly whether we reap the blessing or curse accordingly. Read the word of God and it will not take you long to realize that most of God's promises are conditional. If we fulfill the condition, we reap the reward. If we fulfill the condition, we reap the reward. If we don't, we miss out. If you don't like the harvest, check the seed you're sowing. At the end of the day, we are where we are because of the decisions we make. This means we cannot blame God and we should not blame others. Paul uh, said to the church, at Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, these words, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from the sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. This is the message of encouragement. Hallelujah. 
This is the message of encouragement for the believer who is becoming weary and doing right. Don't give up. Don't get frustrated. Don't throw in the towel. Don't quit. While it may look like some of the unrighteous are getting ahead, don't overly concern yourself with that. Pray for their souls. Keep your focus on God and you're going to reap Hallelujah, the harvest of blessings. It's coming at the right time. Don't you give up. Listen, I'm going to stop right there tonight. We got just a few more verses, so we're going to finish up chapter 13 on next week, and then we're going to go right on into 14. Hallelujah. I'm just so excited about the word of God and what God is doing for us. And I'm so glad that all of you joined me. I pray that you were blessed in the word like I was tonight. Much thanks and appreciation to our, our director of media. He's one of the baddest men on the planet. And that's Elder Ralph Wilson. Hands up to him. We thank God for his, his gifting and him causing me to look good here during our power. Hallelujah. Old boy don't look too bad, does he? <laughs> thank you, Ralph, for helping me tonight. Listen, join me tomorrow. 6 a.m. prayer. God is raising the culture of prayer in Kingdom Life Cathedral Ministries. Join me tomorrow morning. 6 a.m. prayer. There the number is on your screen. Tell somebody. God's been meeting. I, I'm telling you. Tuesday prayer and 6 a.m. was great. 12 noon Tuesday was great. And now Thursday, we're going to be right back on the line praying again. So join us. And then listen, don't miss this, my Lord, this coming Sunday, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be powerful. Listen, they tell me they're celebrating my birthday on Sunday. That's right. I'm going to be another year old, but we're selling on the 14th of August, but we're celebrating it on Sunday. My dear friend and brother, I'm excited. I love this man of God. He's a dear friend. He's been a powerful gift and a voice an apostolic voice and prophetic voice that God has used to speak in the kingdom like the feet of ministry in my life all the way, amen, from Rockledge, Florida, from the Faith Life Outreach Cathedral, um, the Lord's anointed bishop, uh, Anthony Hatcher is going to be with us. And I'm telling you, it's going to be powerful. God has been stirring something in the house every time we come together. And Sunday, you don't want to miss it. I would love to see as many of you there. Let's pack the house up. I know we are safe. Yes, we are. CDC regulations are still in place in 551 Willow Spring Drive. We all wear masks. We practice social distancing. But I want you to come and share with us. If you can't get there, join us right on Facebook Live, 9 a.m. for a powerful time of word and worship. Join us. I'm excited about God. Listen, right after Sunday morning service, we are going to have a meeting again as we're planning for, for the 22nd, our Community Evangelistic Outreach Sunday, which is August the 22nd. For those that join us on Facebook Live, we meet on Sunday at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. Check social media so you can be a part of as we serve our community. I'm excited about that. Many of you have asked, how can I help? Well, you can sow, you can give. It is through your faithful giving that we're able to serve and reach our community. Thank you for those who've called and said, Bishop, how can I donate to, to the Community Evangelistic Outreach Sunday? Some are giving food, some are giving money for food. You say, how can I do that? Well, you can give right online. You can go right to our, 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 our giving, our our. Our website, kingdomlifecathedral.org slash give. And there is a blank line through our giving app. And you could say for uh, for outreach, for evangelism. I'm sorry, they're telling me the word to say for evangelism. Type the word evangelism. You can sow your seed right there. And I'm excited about it. Many of you have called and wanted to know that's where you can get. Someone said, well, Bishop, when can we sign up to work on a team? Well, we're going to have those lists ready for you on Sunday. So watch social media. And on Sunday, please come to sign up. You can sign up. We want to have a way for you to sign up online. So we're going to prepare that so we can minister to our community. Two special dates coming up, August the 22nd 
that Sunday. We're going to have a, a, a short worship service on that Sunday and go into our community and serve. And then on Friday, September 17th, we're going to be having community wide park and praise right in downtown Charlestown, right on the on the parking lot of the bank of Charlestown. You can bring your lawn chair, you can sit in your car, but we're gonna have a city, we have citywide park and praise. You don't wanna miss it at 715. The word's gonna be preached, there's gonna be singing, and we're gonna be sharing the love of Jesus. Hallelujah, come and let the Lord use you. I'm challenging you, man, woman, boy, and girl, join me in prayer now. Let's pray. Let's pray the rest of this month Hallelujah for souls to be one to the kingdom. Listen, we love you. I thank God for you. I thank God for what he's doing in your life. To all of the KLCM citizens, to our iChurch citizens, to all of you, I love you. And I pray the blessings of the Lord be with you. Stay God strong. Stay kingdom strong. And remember, it's your moment in time. Live the kingdom life. I were a